Добрый день. Меня зовут Jeremy Papillon. И... I'm gonna, I'm gonna go in English, actually. In <laughs> uh, that's about all I know in uh, Russian. Uh, before coming here to the conference, I actually took some Russian classes. Um, I was thinking I would speak Russian right now, but apparently it takes more than two months to learn Russian. Who would have thought? So, um, we are from Montreal, Canada, and uh, we work for Uplay, a company that Jean-François uh, co-founded. And um, we just released one of our, well, our first app. It's a mobile app called uh, Dude Game. And um, it's a, it's a real-time uh, mobile app using WebSocket server, using uh, the full stack of, uh, we need to be uh, real-time, real-time, and that's, that's the key for our app. And today, we're here to present to you um, the, our full stack. We actually developed a, a, an app uh, just for the conference to to share with you a bit our um, the the full stack we have the from bottom to top top to bottom so that you can see how easy it is to build a an app not just the server side but also the client side with what we had our with our task with our stack sorry so quick 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 question so who knows what is it <laughs> come on yeah nobody never ever come in Canada. Okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Good job. So that's traditional uh, fast food in, in Canada, actually. Yep. So, um, so I'm going to start. Usually, we do the demo at the end, but uh, I'm going to start with the demo of our app. Yeah, because we're after dinner, so after lunch. Sorry, yeah. So everybody will fall asleep. <laughs> so the app we... Um, oh, yeah, I forgot to mention. We will have a, um, a live gaming experience. Uh, Dude Game is a real-time sports uh, prediction social app. What, what does that mean? Uh, basically, we just launched our app. It's, um, we have, you have the KHL, we have the NHL, and it's, and it's really popular in Canada. So with our app, you can play with your friends, make your predictions on the games that are actually being played. And during the game, with, with your predictions that you've made and with your friends, um, you're, you have a score. We have an algorithm that you have uh, an actual score, and you can challenge your friends, and, uh, like a beer or whatever you want. And uh, so you have a, uh, a, a, a cool game. It, people are just like onboarding like crazy right now, so it's, it's pretty, pretty nice. So we want to be invaded by the, by the, S, the, the East, <laughs> yeah. so by Russia and Ukraine. So you have to download it and play with us. Okay, so I'm actually going to quit that, show you the demo. Okay, this one. Okay, can you guys see? Okay, so we built the app. is uh, is quite simple. It's a chat room. So like, okay, we didn't want to have uh, something too complicated because it's not really the the content, but rather the the whole structure that we want to show. So we built a simple a simple uh, mobile app, and. Um, we, it's, it's basically a chat room that everybody talks. Like you, you see here, there's four simulators, so they, they act as phone, let's say. And you can choose the language you want, your own language. So you can choose, you, I'll show you, you can choose your, your own language that you want to talk into and receive the message into. For example, uh, this guy wants English, this guy Russian, let's say. This guy, well, Klingon. <laughs> Belarusian. <laughs> okay, so and this one I put like uh, let's say uh, Klingon, Klingon, all right, like that. Um, so what we have here is a WebSocket, uh, WebSocket backend. Jean-François is going to talk about it a little bit more later, and. Um, so whenever I write here, for example, in, I start writing. I say like the famous "Hello World." Well, as you can see, the other phones receive the, 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 the message saying that I'm writing, like you see in, every, in Facebook or whatever. So it's really WebSocket being, being sent, saying like some, someone's writing. So this guy is the iPhone 5, so I know, I know this one is writing. So if I write for Hello World, and I send my message, so they receive whatever translation it, it is, I don't know, but <laughs> sometimes it's really... Uh, yeah, weird. So I'm not going to write anything in Russian because, yeah. So, so I've... 
let's say. <laughs> so I guess the translation is wrong, right? <laughs> So it was the other way around. If I knew more Russian, I would, or whatever. So um, I'm going to continue. OK, so I'm going to start. Uh, actually, I'm, I'm starting with uh, the boring part. So I'm going to start with the boring part, let's say, or not that boring, but it's a, the, the client. OK? So we use React Native. I don't know, you guys probably, you all know what React Native is. If you don't, I will explain. Um, React Native is a, is a framework created by Facebook for uh, building mobile apps for Android and iOS out of the box. Um, coming here, we've seen that a lot of people are using Windows phones. Sorry. How <laughs> come, guys? <laughs> Um, and uh, well, they are actually building, well, not Facebook itself, but there's a repo on, on, uh, on GitHub for React Native to start building a uh, Windows Phone app. So it's not built in with React Native, but it might be eventually. Who knows? Um, so the advantage of, of React Native is that we have a, a single source code, code base, in JavaScript. Easier to find one JavaScript developer than one Android developer in one uh, iOS developer. So, the and and what's cool with React Native is that it, it works as a refresh, like a web app that you would develop. So instead of building your app, compiling your app, checking the result, doing that all over again, you just hit like refresh on your simulator to have your your code updated and you see what you've done. Um, also, it's it's not a hybrid app like you would see other frameworks do. It's uh, actually using the native components. So it's not a web view loading a web app. It's really using the native components from Android and iOS. Do you know this guy, by the way? Justin, yeah. He, plays for the Mon he played for the Montreal Canadiens, so yeah. Um, how it, uh, I'll go really quick. Uh, how it works with the architecture is, as you can see, there's the, uh, the bundle, like the IPA or IPK. I like the IPA one. But, and um, on, on that, you have the React Native library, which is bundles, bundles the, the JS engine. Based on React, you have your app running with all your React Native libraries, your G JavaScript libraries. So everything is bundled and acts as a real uh, native app. How it works in, let's say it's a summary. There's a, the JavaScript layer where all your logic, all your stuff is going through. There's the native one, which is runs, well, is the native one. And they built a bridge. And the bridge is simply, well, it's a bridge. Uh, it's serializing, unserializing the commands so that um, you have one for iOS, one for Android. So they're communicating, translating it in, uh, in bytecodes and stuff like that. And the thing is that this works a bit like this. I will show you. Uh, next slide. Yeah. So for, for the WebSockets, we have a WebSocket application. For example, the JavaScript code, your JavaScript code will run. You will, have a, you will send something on the WebSocket. It will put its async, all async. So it will put uh, the callback inside the, the async queue and serialize the request and send it to the native, for example, OKHTTP OK for uh, Android and Socket Rocket for iOS and send a message, native will say, OK, the bridge, here's my response, here's whatever comes from the, the web socket. Bridge deserializes it, calls the, the proper callback function in JavaScript, and goes back up to the JavaScript logic, uh, application logic layer. So um, yeah. So the, the threads, let's call it like that, is mostly this is what happened. You have the JS sending. Uh, 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 a request to the WebSocket, to the component queue. Uh, it, it sends a callback up to JavaScript, then it renders. And there's a shadow queue, which deals with everything that has to do with uh, um, converting to the, your actual view in JavaScript that you set to the, the, native, the native code. So with that structure, you have um, a really async, um, async ar architecture, which means that um, J the JS thread shouldn't, should always be free from the UI thread, from the native UI thread, and vice versa. So the bridge in between, which we saw earlier, 
This one acts as is the bottleneck, basically, because JS code to JS code is fast, native code to native code is fast, but the, but the, the, the bridge is really where it needs to be. Um, it, it, it's really, it could be problematic. So what you need to do is, for example, if you have a component that, that catches this sliding, uh, sliding uh, motion, for example, that sends a, a command up to the JavaScript layer, and JavaScript layer tells the native UI to do something, then you might have back and forth messages, and this is really this is going to cause some problems. So sometimes it's good to off, well, off, offset some of this and create your own components, native components that you will extend to uh, to React Native. So um, so you can create your own native components, but you have to build them in both iOS and, and Android. And there's an interface for uh, exposing it in React Native. Okay, so we have talked about uh, client side. So now let's talk about cool stuff like the server side. <laughs> so like, 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 like uh, Jeremy said, so I'm uh, from the Java uh, world, actually. So I have worked uh, more uh, close to 10 years at Sun Microsystem. So I was uh, responsible first for uh, bringing Glassfish to open source. So I did a lot of work server side, actually. So back in 2009, uh, you know, everybody were, uh, it, it was starting to get, you know, we wanted to have like uh, asynchronous uh, function in Java. So f for the first step we did in 2005, we introduced in GDK2, actually, it was uh, the uh, NIO interface. And then on top of that, we started building uh, different kind of, of API and, uh, and asynchronous uh, framework. So Atmosphere is one of them. It's actually, so like, like, like we said, we're using a WebSocket. So who knows what is a WebSocket? OK, not that bad. OK, so uh, a WebSocket, actually, so if you have work with Socket, so it's the same thing, except that it's inside a browser. So instead of, uh, of uh, using a normal HTTP connection, oh, not, not, not yet. Instead of using uh, an, a normal HTTP connection, where actually the protocol is you send a request to the server, and the server answer you with a response. So with a WebSocket, you just, from the browser, you connect to the server, and you just listen for event. So you don't necessarily, once the, the, the server accepts, the, it, it, it is called the handshake. Once the handshake is get, get accepted, then you can send anything on that connection. And the server can decide at any moment to send you a message. And uh, same thing for the client. So it makes a real-time application and asynchronous application really easy to design because uh, you no longer have to uh, to, uh, to spend time on uh, connecting, reconnecting. Because if, if you remember, if you poll the server, it's, let's say you write a REST application and you poll the server. So you poll, and if the server has something for you, it will send it. You will receive it. But if it doesn't have anything, so you're, you're doing a request like in the void. Because you send a request, say, do I have something? The server answer, no, uh, I you don't have anything for you. So with WebSocket, it's, mo it's much more powerful because you just said, okay, Send me something when, when you have something. If you don't have anything, then nothing goes on the pipeline. So this is how we actually build our uh, our, our, our our game, so do game. So it's it's with WebSocket, and we're getting really amazing uh, real time uh, because we need to deliver the information as fast as possible. So how the games work is you have the hockey game on the ice, and uh, there are some people from the NHL that type what people are doing. Like if you know hockey, like if, if they shot or if, they, if there is a fight. So they're going to write it, and so it, that, that is sent to, through a feed. So we grab that feed, and we build our video game on top of that. So we need to, so if you watch the, 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 the television, so if you watch the, the, the game, then you want to have the information as fast as possible. Because if there is a goal, you don't want to receive the goal like two minutes after, because you're going to go on the website to see it. So it needs to be so we cannot spend time or lose time anywhere. So back to Atmosphere. So we use Atmosphere, of course. Uh, I created it. It's used in a lot of places. It can run on almost every Java server. So from Neti, which is an IO uh, layer, Vertex, which is quite popular as well, Play Framework, if you like Scala. I don't. And uh, you can. Uh, Run it on, on Tomcat, JT, or any Java EE container, even WebSphere, if you have problem. <laughs> if, you, if you have to use it, sorry. <laughs> so it's really, the adoption is quite cool, actually. Uh, 
Actually, you know, you know what? Donald Trump, he wanted to build a wall between uh, Canada and United States, and I hope he will do it. We, everybody in Canada wants to do it. Okay, back to the slide. So this is, you can use Atmosphere, you can write Atmosphere uh, application directly, meaning you use the API. Some of you were there earlier today, I presented uh, more detail about it. But also, uh, since Atmosphere was quite new, uh, quite the first, you know, in, in, in the market about WebSocket and, and, long, and have like long pooling. So all those framework have uh, extension. Uh, some, some of them have like native uh, extension. Like if you use Vadin or Prime Physics, you don't necessarily know. They don't tell you that they use atmosphere under the hood, but it's atmosphere actually. So like I said, it's everywhere. So. What we wanted to do, actually, is, you know, it's, it's quite new those days. I don't know if, if how many of you uh, started writing, like, reactive software. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, so what is reactive software? It's kind of the new buzzword. It's mostly coming from the uh, Scala community, actually. So the guys that wrote Akka. So uh, it's, they, 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 they proposed, like, a reactive manifesto where, actually, let's make it simple. It's just that your application never block. So under the hood, you never, when you do a write or a read to any component, it will never block. So you either pass the promises or a callback, but this is something really new, actually. In, in the Java EE world, let's say if you use the servlet API, it's quite blocking. Okay, in servlet 3.0, they added something, uh, an API, but not a lot of people are using it, actually. So you still have to block, or you use, mostly, you, you try to use library that, uh, that will do it for you asynchronously. So, uh, so reactive software says, you know, it, you want to have, uh, and the talk before was pretty good actually about, you know, you want something pretty small, you want something uh, resilient, elastic, and message driven, meaning that you have one component that is responsible for doing something, so he receives a message and he does something with it. So it, it, we try to, uh, with reactive software, reactive, sorry, programming, or yeah, software, we, ha we try to break like this big monolithic G2EE application. People, of course, will, are starting to use Spring Boot for doing that, even if under the hood it's Tomcat. It's kind of crazy that you run Spring Boot and you have Tomcat in it, uh, because Tomcat, it's not small. It's like pretty, pretty big. So it's really simple to write uh, reactive software with Atmosphere, because it's, it's pretty small and you can run it almost everywhere. So how do, we do, how do we do that, actually? So we have, so I personally, all the projects that I work for the last six years, I use Netty. So who knows what is Netty? Okay, that's good. So Netty, it's an IO layer. It uh, was developed at, uh, by, uh, by a guy in South Korea, and, uh, he moved, and then he moved to Twitter because Twitter was using it all over the place. So it's really, you know, uh, an asynchronous uh, IO library that you can build on top of it. So Twitter use it a lot. And now uh, at Apple, actually, they use it a lot as well for the App Store. So it's pretty simple, pretty small, so you don't have to use, because you, you can do, you can still run Atmosphere on Tomcat, but all the stuff that is in Tomcat, you don't necessarily need it for your application. So for a WebSocket application, it's pretty simple to just use that. So simple I.O. level. So and then so how how it works is we have like a WebSocket processor that will receive WebSocket connection, and uh, and you get the connection and let's call it like, like we said like let's call it a messages. So you receive a messages, you have an event bus that you can dispatch messages to it, and you reach a services. So you can see a services. So if we speak like old people, we can say like it's a kind of a servlet, but an intelligent servlet. An asynchronous servlet, actually. So then you can make things more, more complicated. Like, because the problem that we have with our application right now is, uh, so it's NHL-based. Uh, there is a lot of people that like hockey game. So we cannot have like one services that run, or run one server that run in one places. We, have, we need to have uh, several servers running in, in an Amazon cluster, actually. So, but those, those uh, servers need to talk to each other. Because in our application, we have the same concept as you have in uh, Facebook, which is you play against your, your friends. 
So you don't play against everyone. You just play with, with, with your friends. So you have that concept of, okay, so I sent you a request uh, about do, do you want to be my friend? So if you're live, uh, we need to deliver that request uh, to the proper instance because you're probably, if you're here, you're probably connected on the east side, on Amazon East in Canada because we, 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 we're there, or in Frankfurt, actually. You can connect in Frankfurt, but the other server, like me, I'm in Montreal. So how those servers communicate between each other? So that's why we have added like a message dispatcher API just to make sure that when we run the, the, when we run our services in one server, they will try to detect, okay, so where is, are the other instance? Or It's like a service discovery mechanism. So what we are using for uh, dispatcher, for, 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 so of course we have an in-memory dispatcher. So like for developing, it works pretty well because all messages go on the same machine. So you're, you're on the same machine, so you don't need to go outside. But when we deploy in production, of course we need something more powerful. So we use uh, Kafka for doing that. Pretty good, pretty stable, uh, quite, quite used by LinkedIn and, and Facebook. So we know that solution. So when we started, we knew that that solution will scale pretty well. So then you can have, and that way you can have services that run, let's say, in Frankfurt and services that run in Montreal, and they can communicate uh, between each other transparently. Okay, so how do we do that, actually? So, it's, uh, so we use a REST approach for dispatching messages. So if you have worked with Jersey, we're pretty close to, to that approach, meaning that when you send a WebSocket messages, you put a path in it. And uh, so with the path, we're able to dispatch the message to the proper services. So pretty simple, actually. Pretty easy to debug. And so... And how, ser how services, oh, so how do we build those services? So it, we make it pretty simple, actually, because we're a small team and we wanted to, uh, I, I don't, because finding good Java people uh, in Quebec, it's hard, actually. So I don't know why. I think we got invaded by PHP guy and they took the market and now we're stuck with them. So we wanted to have a cle really a small approach or a, a clean approach. To, uh, to make services, so to allow developer, even so client-side developer like Jeremy can write like uh, server-side component pretty easily. So how we do that, actually? So we make it really simple with one interface to rule them all, actually. So it's, you have a in public interface called services. You have a type, and what, 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 what the server will do, it will call that services with an envelope, so that's, and that envelope will contain some messages and a reply. That's it. So with the reply, you will be able to, let's say, if you want, you re, so the, the services receive a messages, wants to reply to somebody, uh, to, want, to, to the guys that have sent the messages, or if, if, it's, this, if, if it's the runtime, it will re reply, let's say, to, 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 to the client directly. So it will use that object to reply. So that's pretty simple. So, so how it works when, when you receive, actually. So like I said, we, have, we just annotate a simple class that implement uh, the services. Uh, so here we, we want to receive envelope. We have an on annotation. So it's pretty close to Jersey, actually, what, what we're doing, except the problem that, so now you can ask, okay, so why you're not using Jersey instead of reinventing the wheel? The problem with those frameworks, not only Jersey, but the REST framework that is, exists right now is they run on top of HTTP not WebSocket. So they all have extension, like Jersey can run on top of Atmosphere. But you have that big overhead in between where they try to hack using JSR 356, which is the uh, WebSocket API in Java. They try to wrap the WebSocket message that they receive and transform it into, uh, transform the object into an HTTP object. So like your REST uh, services, like in Jersey, will behave the same way if you use uh, HTTP than if you use WebSocket. So you lost a lot of performance by doing that. So that's why actually we, we decided to not go there and just like use Atmosphere in a really pure uh, WebSocket approach. So here you get a messages and then from the messages you can have, you can do whatever you want. So it could, it could be like an HTTP, not an HTTP request, but some kind of request that uh, you want to, uh, to, to, to execute. So pretty simple. Like I said, you receive a message, you do something on it, make some call to Cassandra or whatever, 
And then once you're ready, then you just take the envelope and, uh, re and attach the message to it. So pretty simple to write a really complex game, actually. So how do we send uh, messages between uh, services? So this is where actually we uh, we have that the concept of a private, of a sorry of an event bus. This is where actually you get you take the message the, the envelope sorry that you receive and you use a dispatcher to just dispatch it. So this is where actually everything under the hood will uh, will do the work for you actually. Will so the dispatcher will say okay where is that uh, where this what what is the the envelope destination actually is it a user. Okay, so where is that user? So this is where actually we're going to take the, the, the envelope and put it into Kafka. And what Kafka will do for us, it will take the message and dispatch it to all, uh, to all connection, uh, no, sorry, to all services that, that listen to that topic. So we can do that transparently. So if the services is located on the same uh, GVM, then we, we, of course we won't go into Kafka. We will know that, okay, we own that services, so let's dispatch it directly. Okay, so how does it work? So actually I forgot to ask a, question, a, bas a basic question at the beginning. So who has used Atmosphere? Okay, good. Not a lot. Come on, guys. Uh, so uh, in Atmosphere you have many ways to write services. You have like high level uh, API that you can use to write services that will be able to be used by HTTP requests and also WebSocket. You can also uh, write just pure WebSocket. And that was our main goal for us. It was to write you know, pure WebSocket. We didn't want to go with HTTP. Six years ago, uh, it was you know, the proxy, not, not the internet wasn't ready for WebSocket. You know, we were having a lot of trouble, a lot of proxy actually, were receiving a WebSocket request and they were like, what is that? So close it. So they were closing it. So you needed to implement all kind of ping and pong to make sure that you know, the proxy thinks that it's a normal HTTP connection, that there is some activity on it. So going in production with, uh, with WebSocket six years ago, I would, not, uh, I would have not thought about it. Now it's much more uh, easier, actually, because the internet has, has, has improved. And uh, almost all proxies that exist uh, right now supports WebSocket and are configured to make it work. So, uh, so for us, we use Nginx. And uh, so like I said, we have many, many users all across the uh, United States and Canada. And we never heard somebody uh, saying, OK, I'm unable to connect to your server. So because something in between uh, is closing the connection. So like I said, Six, five years ago, it wasn't the case. I would have never uh, recommended to use WebSocket to write application. So we did try it from here, and it works well also, even if the server are far away from here. So I just want to show you some code about how we did that. Where is the... So for those of you that have uh, write WebSocket application uh, using Atmosphere, you may have been familiar with uh, an interface that is called, sorry, let's go up, that is called WebSocket process, processor, actually. So here it, it, it's an adapter. But uh, mostly the, the, what, what I want to show you, the important part here is your callback will receive a WebSocket object, easy. So here you can do, so here it's really the, the key pieces of, uh, of our game, actually. All requests goes through that, uh, that code. So when a WebSocket open, then you get a callback that calls you saying, okay, so here's the WebSocket, you can do anything, uh, you can do whatever you want with it. So uh, in that case here, so we do some, really some basic stuff and, um, so then we have the WebSocket open. And the good thing about the WebSocket here is that, uh, so because 
you can always, and, and that, that's where actually we're saving a lot on, on memory. So the WebSocket will be the key part of your application, meaning that you can attach state on the WebSocket. So anywhere in your services architecture, if, if you design it well, there should never have state, meaning that uh, if you're able to attach your state or some, it's like a cookie for WebSocket, actually. Let's call it like that. You can put, you can put some information server-side uh, to attach it to the WebSocket and, do, and, and keep like some state. Of course, my preference, and this is what we're doing uh, with the game, is there is no state at all. So we receive a connection from the, from, from the client because we're not talking about web here. Even, even if it's a React Native application, the, the client knows things. It has states. It has access to uh, the phone, some kind of phone database on, on, on its side. So meaning that the we don't need to keep trace of, uh, of what's happening with the client. So client is able to send its, its proper state and knows where you are. So let's say the game starts, you play the game, uh, and, uh, and you close your phone. So when you come back, so the phone knows, or the, the application knows that, OK, the game was started, and uh, this, is where we, we, this is where the client was at that time, and rearrange and recalculate its stuff. So we don't need to have a state server side saying, OK, oh, this is this, this client. It has disconnected, uh, so let's recompute its state. So the client is able to do it all by itself. So that's an API in Atmosphere uh, here. So the, the key part, again, is so invoke WebSocket protocol, meaning that you receive a WebSocket, a connection, and uh, so final WebSocket, you receive bytes uh, from the layer under the hood. So it, like I said, could be Tomcat, JD. Me, I prefer using Netty. So pretty simple. You decode what you receive. You, so we do some, some stuff here. We attach a, a simple UUID to it. So we have uh, here. I, it's more, it's more about how you want to, uh, how you want to handle the reply object that I have shown earlier, which means that because again, and this is why I have a condition here like a unique, unique map or a unique reply, sorry or not, is if and where, 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 where sending and receiving because because you know it's a social application. So let's say you want to invite friend, you start chatting with your friend. Uh, it's the same thing. We have that in, 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 in the application as well. So you might send a lot of messages, which means that if you send, I don't know, 10 messages, but everybody sends 10 messages at the same time. So we have like 10,000 uh, requests to handle, or messages, not, not, not requests, actually, because the WebSocket connection is persistent. You're connected all the time. So here, the goal is to create, uh, is to don't, you don't want to fill up the heap of your GVM with a lot of, sm uh, of, of small objects. So here, that's why first we, we, we didn't have that code where we, 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 we say unique reply. So we were creating a reply on every WebSocket message that we were receiving. And we, when we, 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 we did the measurement, we realized that, wow, we were able to scale more than 2,100 more connections by just removing that and just have a single reply that is stateless. So, so that way, uh, if, uh, if we receive several uh, WebSocket messages at the same time, so we will have only one reply per WebSocket instead of, uh, let's say, 10, 10 instead of uh, one, re one reply per uh, messages. So we, we were able to significantly uh, improve performance by doing that. The last operation that we do, like I showed at the beginning, is we have an event bust. So we can, we have, so you can configure it. Uh, but the, the, the key part here is uh, how do you dispatch? Uh, so you want to dispatch that uh, messages to, uh, to services. And you don't care where is the services. Is it on the same machine or it's located somewhere else? And last API, it's the, uh, the close. So you can do whatever you want with that. But it's, it's really when somebody closed or the client closed the connection or a proxy closed the connection. So that API would, will get called. So it's quite simple to do. And that allows us to do cool things like, uh, let me.
So that's the code that we, have, we are using for the demo that we did uh, at the beginning, which is, uh, so here we have a message dispatcher that receives an envelope, so we use uh, Jackson to decode the envelope. So we set a clock on the messages, so we re-encode uh, the, the, the messages in B64, and then, uh, so li 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 like Jeremy demonstrated, so we receive the messages and we send it to everyone. So if we wanted to have like, okay, one-to-one uh, uh, -one messages, we, would, we wouldn't have done that. But here what we are doing, is we just have a WebSocket factory that has all the WebSocket connected. On, so uh, not, not connected, but that has a reference to all WebSocket connected. So we cycle over it to push the messages to all connected services. Uh, not services, sorry, to all connected clients. So this is how the code works uh, for the small demo that we did. We also have, so that's, let's say, as a developer in, uh, so if you're a developer and I hired you uh, in Yulplay uh, to work on, on the game, then this is what the kind of services that you're going to have to write. So you don't need to go into the detail. But my, why I, I, I was demonstrating the WebSocket processor, actually, but if you want, as a developer, to go really low level and you don't care about this services stuff, you don't want to, you don't care about that, you just want to receive messages, send messages the way you want, or just send them to an MQ, whatever, and then you can implement that. What I'm showing now, it's much more high level, actually. Okay, and let's look at another one. When the client was typing during the demo, uh, that was the same thing. We were seeing uh, that, you know, all, 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 all uh, phone emulator was, you were seeing that somebody was typing. So this is how we're doing it with WebSockets. It's pretty simple. The, the key part here uh, to, 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 to not forget is uh, it's really simple with WebSockets because you don't have to care about is the connection, is the client connected or not. If I have a WebSocket to, uh, on server side, that means that somebody is connected. I don't have to care about, okay, is it connecting, disconnecting? Is it in the middle of connecting? Because let's, with long polling, this is how it happens. When you poll the server, you poll the server, okay, is it, do I have a messages? They say, no, you don't have messages. Then by the time you get the HTTP response, you may receive a messages. So if you don't have a cache server side, then the next time you connect to the server, you will lose that messages, unless you have cache it. I, I know it's pretty hard to write because in atmosphere we have cache, cache, for exactly for that, for when the, when the client uh, connect and reconnect, and that's pretty hard to, uh, to maintain and to configure properly. So this is another example of, yeah, of services that you can write, so pretty simple. Okay, one, one last thing. Let's go. Sorry, I have to... I, because we, we were supposed to do the, the, the talk with two computers, but I, I learned at the beginning that I only have one, so the code is on my machine. So that's a client-side machine here. That's why I have to go to GitHub. Let me... Okay. So how do we... Uh, how do we tell, actually, you saw, uh, we, I'm using a lot of inject annotation. So who has worked with inject, injection, actually? Okay, so there's still some people not using injection. Oh, okay. So you have, you have, you know, there's pretty good library that does injection. Uh, Google Juice is one. It's pretty good. Spring does a pretty good job, but I don't like Spring. And, uh, and also, you, we have built-in really small uh, injection framework in Atmosphere that we can use. So we can write, actually, how we want to inject uh, object. So how injection works, so quickly, is that you, you saw it. It's a, let's go back to the slide. So you use an annotation, and that's the container, or the framework that takes care of putting the, the real value in, like, like the even bus. So that's pretty powerful. Because the event bus is an interface, so the framework can inject whatever he wants for you under the hood. So how it works with Atmosphere, actually, is you just can tell, you just 
you know, we have like this, uh, so the MetaM services, which is standard Java API that you have in the GDK. And uh, so you just put your, your, the object you want to, to uh, the implement, yeah, you, you tell actually the framework how you want to inject your object or they are created. So let's say if we take, for example, the, the object mapper, let's look at, So when we want to inject an object mapper, it's pretty simple. It's a pretty stupid example, but I, ju I just wanted to show you. So you have a small API, so you create your wrong mapper here. And every time uh, the, 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 the framework will see that it requires injection, he will grab the value from that class. So, and that's, that's pretty standard, actually. So why I'm showing that is because I didn't want to use juice or worst spring. For, for, for our framework because I wanted to have something really simple. So this one is like quite simple. And it's quite popular if you use Atmosphere. Uh, people are using it a lot. OK, so uh, finally, actually, uh, so this is how uh, we did the, uh, the, uh, the demo. So like I have shown, you have the first layer, which is okay, NIO under the hood. We have a WebSocket processor. We have uh, an even bus that will dispatch messages to uh, the two services that we have wrote. So of course, we can write tons of services. We could have done a demo with Kafka in between, but I, I don't think that was the key things to do here. That's why, if you want, uh, later during the day at, at, at 6 in the lobby, we can install, actually, the real game so you can see it uh, real time. Because what we're going to do is we're going to fake uh, an NHL game, because there is no game right now. It's too early in America. And so you can see how real time is, actually. Because we start a fake game. And at first, we wanted to do a game, uh, Canada versus Belarusia. But when we saw the score, we decided not to show you that, if you remember last time we played against you. So OK, so in conclusion, so React Native plus WebSocket, it's really powerful. So we. You know, we build the company on top of that. And so far, uh, the company is growing. Everything is doing pretty good. So we're now six people. And like, you will hear about the game, I'm pretty sure. So if you want to write an application with Atmosphere, so that's the link to GitHub. It's already uh, it's, it's there. It's a lot of activity there. You have 50, uh, more than 50 uh, samples that you can use or reuse, and you can run it. In, uh, deploy them in the container that you want. And if you want to try something more new, then this is the open source. So we have open sources, the reactive boot that we call it. So the framework that I just pre presented, uh, we just put it in our uh, public repo. So if you want straight, the demo is there, client is there as well. So you can, you can chat and laugh about the, the translation, actually. Uh, thank you. So yeah, so like I said, at six, if you want to try it. So any question? OK, I'm coming. I have a question to Jeremy. OK. Uh, OK. Uh, do, are you satisfied with um, React Native performance? Um, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty good right now. I mean, as I explained, you have, you have uh, some areas that uh, you need to be careful, mostly the UI events, so the transitions and everything. But the team, the actual community in the team is doing very good right now. They're pushing a lot of components that were only in running in, in JavaScript, and they see that there is some problems in performance, and they're actually moving them more towards the uh, native side. So you have, you just code in JavaScript, for example, that component, but it's actually really running, handling all the UI, all the, the, the transitions and everything in native. So you have the native performance using JavaScript. Okay, and I have another question. Uh, how big is your code base and is it easy to maintain it? Go ahead. JavaScript code base. Uh, the JavaScript code base, uh, I don't know the size of it. I mean, because uh, the app, is, well, our app is pretty big, but I, I can actually show you just for the, the, the app, the demo we showed, I think it's the 
stop here. It's pretty small. Actually, the, the cool thing about it is you can really develop on i on iOS, and uh, there is, you know, remember the first day of Java where you were writing AWT, and you were thinking, ah, I'm gonna do it on on uh, on on, uh, on Linux, and it will work easily on Mac, and that was catastrophic. So they made a better job there, actually. So you because we we develop mostly uh, on iOS, and uh, and when we deploy on Android, it just works. Yeah, so basically, just quick, quick, uh, quick explanation. The code actually comes uh, once the JavaScript package is loaded. It gets in the uh, either if you're with Android or with iOS, it loads the proper. You could you could have your your uh, difference. Because sometimes there's some differences between uh, iOS and Android, so you need to specify uh, to create a file, and React Native takes care of it. Uh, so you create your your app. So the app is called the uh, High World here. This is the WebSocket connection code. This is the loader in the chat room. Chat room with well, like this states, this this little configuration that we had, and those are the translators. This is it. So this so for just for that, I mean, and it's highly maintainable because we don't have any difference between uh, between uh, Android and iOS. Very few. Any other question? Another question? Come on, guys. We came from Montreal. You have to ask questions to make us proud. Uh, I have a question. How do you handle the TCP connection timeouts from the clients to the load balancer? Does server and client detect the uh, connection being closed? So actually, that's the Nitty layer that does that server side for us. So because it, yeah, yeah. So it it easily it. it at the beginning, I, I, I think the uh, GDK has some issue about uh, detecting close connection. We didn't suffer from that a lot, let's say, from the Java EE world, because, uh, because it, we were just, you know, long polling wasn't used a lot. So we were like just pinging. So even if the, the, the GDK under the hood doesn't detect that you have disconnected, then you know the client eventually will reconnect. It was creating some memory leak uh, client server side. Like in Tomcat, we have like some, some code for, for checking that. But now, the GDK has improved significantly. So you never missed a disconnect most, per, most of the time. And do you send like heartbeats or pings to keep the connection alive? So the WebSocket has, uh, has an API for doing that server side. Uh, client side, it's not exposed in, in, in the JavaScript. But client side, you can send pong and ping. So to the client, actually. So you can keep alive your connection doing that. We don't do it right now because, like I said, we were doing that earlier when, when, when you hit like a pretty bad proxy that doesn't understand how uh, WebSocket protocol works. But right now, we don't have to do that uh, frequently. Uh, uh, and what about uh, the memory leaks when a uh, client will, for example, go away, phone will, will explode, and server will not get the close? Socket, or will it get closed with WebSocket always? So we don't have that issue right now uh, about about that because you know it's we could have it, but we don't have the states server side. That's why. So even if the client disconnect all the time, uh, it will be able to retrieve. You know, it own its its own data. So we don't have that problem of oops, it was disconnected when we were trying to send it something. Of course, like for for peer to peer messaging, so we have. We use Cassandra for that. So we store the data inside Cassandra. So when the user connects, so that's kind of a state that we retrieve from the database. Okay, thank you. OK. So stop, 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 stop speaking. Um, thank you for your uh, presentation. And uh, I don't understand where is the uh, authentication layer. Uh, I mean, uh, when you have a message, you need to know that uh, for the right person, which uh, sent one, and maybe you need the additional uh, registry uh, to check attention. Okay, so client side, uh, for we use uh, we're lazy, so we use Facebook and Google Plus API. So we we authenticate with them. Once you're once we know like for the application, once you get authenticated, then you enter the application. 
But after that, the messages that, that, we, that we share with services, they don't necessarily need, uh, they don't need to, uh, they don't need any security actually, because once you're connected, you're in the system, so we just dispatch messages. Of course, we could have security saying if we get corrupted messages, we like somebody trying to act us because he wants to increase its score. That will happen, that may happen, but so far, uh, it, that, it haven't. It haven't because you need to break the WebSocket security because, of course, we use uh, SSL, so it's an encrypted WebSocket. Still, you can, you can, you know, it's easy. So you take your our app and fake that you're connecting the server and do reverse engineering. Everybody is doing, is able to do that. But then inside, uh, we have some kind of uh, secret key that we exchange between client and server to at least make sure that the connection, uh, you know, is uh, that because it, we call it the WebSocket sub protocol actually, where we have a protocol. So, but of course, anybody can learn it again. That so so far there is no. Uh, like we don't use any uh, Java EE filters or uh, our library for uh, for security. Maybe we should. More questions? Mm. So we are done. Thank you. Thank you.